Good afternoon, dear viewers. Welcome to ET Auto on this very special EV day panel discussion that we have. Now, in the era of new economy and startups, disruption is a much abused word. In the case of electric mobility, though, there can be no better word. Our planet is at a crossroad today, and to save it, nothing less than a disruption will do. Or at least so it seems. For the transport and mobility sector, which is one of the significant contributors to carbon emissions, which in turn is a major contributor to global warming, the writing is on the wall. The industry needs to clean up. There are more than one way to achieve that, and electric mobility is one of the more prominent ones. It comes with its own set of challenges though. How soon can we realistically electrify our transport sector, for example? Okay. What about charging infrastructure or well-to-wheel emissions? Even if we electrify sufficiently, given that we use thermal coal in our power generation, will it even make a difference? These are important questions that need deliberations and an honest fact-checking exercise. To do just that, on the occasion of World Evening, gather a power-packed panel to discuss the many issues related to electric mobility in India. The people here do not necessarily need an introduction, but for the sake of protocol, I will quickly run through the drill. From India's largest car maker, Maruti Suzuki, we have Mr. Sashank Shivastav, the Senior Executive Director for Sales and Marketing in the company. Shashank San, as we call him, is an alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad and has spent over three decades in the company and has donned various roles in the organization. Also from the Fobula side, we have Mr. Rajiv Chaba, the president of MG Motor India, a veteran in the industry, also with more than three decades of experience. He, he started his career at Aishal Motors in 1990 after completing his master's from IIM Bangalore and has held various senior positions within the top of global automotive brands such as Chevrolet, Cadillac, Opel, and Buick across multiple international markets. In 2005, he was the president and managing director of General Motors in India. He has also served as a VP and marketing sales at Shanghai General Motors in China and as a chairman and MD for GM in North Africa and Egypt. To represent the two and three wheeler industry, we have Mr. Nagesh Baspanhali, the group CEO at Greaves Cotton. Nagesh has a mechanical engineering degree from Bangalore University and a master's of science from the University of Texas. He also has a rich experience of working in diverse companies and prior to Greaves Cotton, he had a two decade stint at Fiat Chrysler, where he last served as the president and managing director of Fiat Group in India. To put forth the views from the component supply side, I welcome Mr. Sanjay Kapoor, the chairman of Sona Comstar. Sanjay did his schooling from Doon and followed it up with a VBA from University of Buckingham. He also deserves two rounds of congratulations for a very successful IPO of his company last month and for becoming the president of ACMA. Many congratulations, Sanjay, and welcome on board. We also have with us Ms. Mahua Acharya, the CEO of Convergence Energy Services Limited, a public sector firm which is at the forefront of furthering the cause of sustainability in the area of energy and mobility. She has two decades of international experience in green finance, renewables, and carbon markets. Ms. Acharya has a degree of, in master's from Yale and has served at the Global Green Growth Institute as the Assistant Director General and as the head of the Investment and Policy Solutions Division, where she introduced green finance into the organization's corporate agenda and established a team that worked across 16 countries. And finally, let me welcome Mr. Rajiv Singh, partner and leader of the automotive practice at Deloitte in India. Rajiv has an over two decade experience as well, starting his career at Tata Motors and has worked across automotive, consumer and retail industrial products and high tech sectors. A round of welcome for all of you. We are thrilled to have you. And uh, I hope the next one hour will give our listeners and viewers a lot of, a lot of things to take home and deliberate upon. To start off with, uh, let me ask Sashank San, uh, you, you represent the largest 
passenger vehicle manufacturer in India. What are your thoughts about the electric mobility story in India and how is Maruti uh, planning this transition from being largely a fossil fuel led company to at one at some point in time becoming an electric vehicle major? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Suman, for having me on this panel. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great honor for me. And uh, on the question of uh, electric uh, mobility, uh, you have made some uh, really uh, fine opening points. And I think uh, I agree uh, almost 100% with what you said. In, in As far as electric mobility is concerned, uh, worldwide, if you see, there has there is uh, been a, a very great shift in terms of environmental concerns. And today, uh, when people talk of climate change or increased temperatures across the globe, uh, people realize that we need to move towards a less carbon society. And I think one of the prime uh, ways of doing it, apart from other sectors, is the auto sector. So uh, really, all governments are pushing the electric vehicle uh, uh, projects. They are also uh, not just electric vehicle, the fuel uh, efficient and the more uh, 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 friendly uh, fuel, uh, uh, environment friendly fuels. So I think uh, uh, it is not no, it's no longer a question of uh, weather, but it's a question of when. So it's, it's a matter of time when uh, this technology, the, the clean technology in, 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 in vehicles will come. And I think all manufacturers are working towards it. Having said that, the, it is obviously a very disruptive technology in, in the sense that in the auto industry, this is seen as one which will change many equations of the business rules and the way business the, the different players play the game. I think it's very important, uh, but uh, the pace is obviously would be determined not just by the government push, the regulations, the subsidies which are given by the government, but also uh, by, by uh, the, the technology improvement as far as battery cost is concerned, bringing down the cost of acquisition to customers or the charging infrastructure that you mentioned. So I think uh, the route to electric vehicles in our country would probably be uh, through the hybrid route rather than straight away jumping to EVs. Uh, if you are looking at scale. So we have to be bothered about scale up as well because companies also have to have a good business model for the same. So if we also look, at, and you mentioned rightly, we have to also be uh, looking at very careful, carefully, not just the emission of the cars, uh, uh, if we are getting into the EVs, but also uh, what we call cradle to grave uh, 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 pollution, which means starting from uh, not just... Uh, the vehicle making, but from the energy production as well. So I think a number of factors will play uh, the game. And I think uh, the way the battery costs are coming down, the point of inflection when EVs will take off uh, rapidly is not very far. And I think that is what the group will discuss and debate uh, in the next few, uh, uh, next, next few um, minutes. And I will definitely like to make more points, uh, but these are my introductory points, Suman. Thank you. So just uh, just one follow up question before I move on to the other panelists, Sachang San. Uh, as a yeah. market leader, you have a tremendously high market share in a market like India. Uh, yeah. Is it a bigger challenge for you to try and adopt a new technology, given the fact that in your own portfolio right now you are doing pretty well? So this shift for anybody who's an incumbent who's coming in who's not present. He can probably take the call and say that, oh, I only have to focus on electric vehicles, so let's go full on. Whereas for you, you will have to balance both sides because the customer right now is a petrol slash diesel customer and eventually he will turn to electric. But how do you, how do you manage this, this whole complexity of when to go full on in electric and how to keep supporting the petrol customer? Yeah, so Suman, that's a very fine point you have made. And it is not just about uh, uh, EV technology, but any disruptive technology which comes in, not only in the auto industry, but across industry, the incumbent players, especially market leaders, they have this dilemma and good management decisions may not necessarily be the best ones for the disruptive scenario. So I think that was uh, something which was examined in great detail in the very famous book called Innovator's Dilemma. 
uh, you know, sometime in 2000 or so, where they said market leaders have a bigger problem uh, because they have to not only decide when to switch, uh, they are not really built for disruption. They are built for uh, uh, process execution because they are the, the technology, they, they are market leaders. So they are already in a section where they are all, uh, doing very well. So they are built for execution efficiencies. They are built for continuation of the existing processes. So right. yes, the challenge is bigger, but I think what we have realized is, and uh, in that sense, we are sort of, uh, we, we will be uh, um, uh, quite prepared, I believe, because uh, we have a system by which you can be agile while still being the market leader and going about the business uh, uh, which you are doing currently. So right. yes, we intend we intend to be agile, uh, Suman, and uh, that's the message for everybody uh, who is uh, listening in. Right. Thank you. Thank you for these opening comments. I will. I would like to bring uh, Rajiv Chaba of MG Motor into the debate now. Uh, uh, Rajiv, unlike Sashank San at Maruti, you do not have this dilemma of being the market leader and so trying to decide which way to go. And uh, I'm, I'm quite glad to see that in the first year itself, you launched an electric model in your portfolio. I understand you have many more models coming in. Uh, give, us, give us a sense of how you look at electric mobility. Is that a big area of growth, potential growth for a company like MG Motor? So like, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, take it forward from Shashank, you know, and as, as Shashank said pretty clearly and rightly that, you know, they have different kind of issues because the kind of life cycle they are in, the kind of stage they are in, they are the market leaders, huge volumes, and we have different kind of issues, right? Uh, they don't have to establish themselves in this market, right? Everybody knows Maruti Suzuki, uh, whereas we are concerned, uh, you know, we want to get established. And when we want to get established in our own unique way, why should people think about MG when they know Maruti and Hyundai sell 70%, they have 70% market share, right? So our strategy had to be different. And that's why, like, you know, we thought about technology and EVs and all that stuff. But, but more than that, uh, you know, one thing which I think all of us agree and probably would say that, you know, all the, all the alignment from government perspective, regulators, activists, consumers, all are aligning towards EV, you know, due to various reasons. You know, and, and let's not forget about cost of ownership in future about EV. Even right now, cost of ownership is low. It is going to be lower. But like any change management, there are lots of concerns and unanswered questions. You know, so this whole journey has just started and it will evolve. You know, uh, but one thing is very clear. EV is the future uh, and, uh, and we have it. So we want to flaunt it. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, our ZSEV, as an example, surprised us. Um, and it keeps surprising us every month. Like uh, last month, as an example, uh, we got 700 bookings for ZSEV. You know, and mind it, this is 24 lakhs rupees car, you know, ex showroom basis. So 700 orders, we were planning for about 200 cars a month kind of a situation. So it means it tells you the consumers are ready. But again, this volume is very small. If you compare to, we sell two and a half lakhs cars a month. Right. So, so the volume is very small, but the journey has started. So we are very, very keen that I think we need to take advantage of this changing consumer behavior. Uh, and, and by the way, we need to have India specific solution. That's also very important in EV and four wheeler. I, I would say players like Maruti and, and Hyundai and Kia's are uniquely positioned because they can, because they have the volume, so they can uh, get a unique Indian solution. You know, and we don't have to go for a global solution in terms of so many kilometers you need to do, uh, you know, of battery and things like that, because, you know, uh, India is different. Driving habits are different. So uh, definitely we want to be in forefront and and our we are launching one car right now, which is not EV, but our next car again will be an EV. So so we'll have two EVs out of five cars in four years time. So Rajiv, you mentioned that uh, the performance of the ZS EV has surprised you. you. You got 700 bookings last month, which is more than almost three times more than what you would anticipate normally. Has that, uh, has that led to you expediting your plans for EVs for the future? Are you, in a way, shortening the, the launch timelines, for example, looking at various other options of launching EVs in different segments and hats? Has that process started now? Absolutely. Can you, can you give us some more? How many cars can we expect from NG and 
uh, and it looks like you sense that because others are not active right now in this space, there's only NG and, and Tata and Hyundai to some extent, the, the rest are still sitting on the fence. It looks like NG senses an opportunity that nobody is playing here. Let's go in and grab some market share. Sumanth, I would like to I would like to correct one thing that I I doubt anybody is sitting on fence. You know, Shashank may not be allowed to say something at this point of time. <laughs> you know, and Shashank may not say it, but I'm sure Maruti Hyundai everyone is working on it, rightly so, and they must be working on it, right? So, uh, so as far as the, like you know, MG is concerned. Uh, Yes, the next product is going to be EV and it's going to be price point wise lower than ZS EV, which is 24 lakhs. So we want to bring the next car below 20 lakhs. Okay, okay. So let's uh, move away from four wheelers now for some time and let's look at the two and three wheeler uh, industry, which where probably the inflection point is almost around us. Uh, so uh, Nagesh, I would like to come to you because yours is a very interesting case. You are one of the biggest diesel engine makers and now you are making the transition into electric two and three wheelers uh, tell us something about your story how did you how are you managing this this kind of transition where your business is focused on something uh, which is now completely different from what your focus is going to be for the future yeah thanks uh, Suman. thanks uh, for having me on uh, good afternoon everybody yeah i'm uh, you brought up an interesting point. I think the transition in the middle of a disruption, right? Um, I'll start off with saying, I'm so glad I'm in the two-wheeler, three-wheeler today, having spent most of my life in four-wheeler, right? In Detroit and uh, else China. Um, the reason being, like you're saying, I think these are exciting times. Why do I say that? Uh, because of the uh, some of the place things and the factors forming into place, right? So how, how and why did we get in? We always thought of ourselves as we were into last mile mobility. On any given day, we were mobilizing millions of people and we were mobilizing with millions of tons of cargo. It was done through what we called a diesel engine or a petrol engine in the past. Four years ago, uh, uh, we said, we will get into a fuel agnostic strategy and that meant it's an and and an and. We were predominantly a B2B company. We said we will move from a B2B to a B2B plus B2C. We will get closer to a consumer. And we said, how do we get into this fuel agnostic strategy where the future relevant products? Electric to us was a no brainer for a couple of reasons because you don't have to go too far someone these days. The e-rickshaw guy uh, sitting in Patna who's earning a livelihood or in Gurgaon or the two-wheeler driver who delivers your food parcels every day, most of them are coming in electric vehicles. Why is that? Because of the unit economics again. And this, we believe a lot of things are forming in place very quickly. If I can touch upon it, the future is electric. Government policies statewide and FAME too have really impacted that, or especially over the last six to 12 months. Consumer behavior, when you look at post COVID is moving more towards personal mobility, sustainable tourism. I'm just gonna throw a couple of points and then we can elaborate later. Sustainable tourism, you don't have to go too far from Goa or Rajasthan and you're seeing that's moving electric. Startup ecosystem is working on a lot of stuff that's uh, developing the uh, backbone of the EV. We also have challenges, which is awareness, range anxiety, our supply chain needs to get better financing, right? So it's not easy, it's not done. But as we go forward, I think India is a country where 80% of our population is two-wheeler and three-wheeler. It is imperative if we have to change that Delhi day on November, right? It doesn't get too far, gentlemen and ladies. On a November day in Delhi, you see what happens. So if you need to change that, you need to start moving towards sustainable solutions. And that's kind of where we are. And I think the other thing in order to accelerate this, investing in R&D right here in India, investing in the supply chain right here in India. And uh, last but not the least, the go-to-market solutions, which would be a combination of physical and digital. That uh, would be my introductory remarks. Happy to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nagesh. Obviously, I'll, I'll come back to you with more specific questions, but uh, I, I like to bring uh, Sanjay in now. 
and you represent uh, a very large industry uh, of the component sector and this is a very this, this forms the backbone of the automotive industry overall and probably you are facing the winds of transition the most because you will do whatever oems want and while some oems may not want you to move to evs immediately in your mind probably you already already decided that evs are the future so you will need to invest in evs and the investments are massive but at the same time the returns will probably come much later so for you how are you trying to make sense of this transition in a way that it is smooth and painless because unlike oems some of the auto component manufacturers they do not have a very deep pockets either thanks suman um you know it's it's a very interesting time for us because the industry is going through a lot of disruption uh you know from disruption not just from the oem perspective but from uh supply chain uh, disruption in the environment as well when we're looking at uh you know infrastructure and the ecosystem for ev uh, you know we're also looking at uh, wind solar battery uh you know transport as a service so you know the, the 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 kind of disruption that the industry is going through is is immense um you know we're fortunate to be uh to catch this at the right time uh, you know as a business ourselves 20% of our um, revenue comes from electric vehicles uh you know we positioned ourselves so that we can supply into evs from an industry perspective it's imperative that industry invests in r&d uh, you know and some of the speakers have spoken about this um because it is really uh, in, you know so it's it's inevitable that we will go electric uh, just because of demand from regulation demands from end customers uh, the automotive industry is well positioned to create all you know manufacturing hub the government's been very supportive in creating uh you know this whole atmanirbhar program where uh also hopefully soon announcing the pli scheme which will again create export champions um you know so all everything moving in the direction of the automotive industry or the component industry investing in technology uh for the future you know we used to be a built to print uh industry many many years ago today we're in, involved in design right from the black box stage you know i'm mean, i'm proud to say that several indian companies uh you know are designing uh their own technology they own their own technology and also uh you know exporting from an as an industry you know our uh you know our exports are pretty significant um you know in terms of you know an overall uh, sales revenue uh, so you know we're well positioned and um, we're ready to you know embrace this change uh, and this disruption this disruption is you know you talk about the famous case which is connectivity autonomous electric and shared mobility uh, and we're seeing ev uh, grow most rapidly in this entire uh, uh, area in terms of um, you know technology uh, technology change globally of course i think we're going to see autonomous and electric grow very rapidly uh, you know uh, quicker than we may think uh, it, it and 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 we need to be prepared for that Uh, and again you know we need to continuously invest in technology which companies in india are doing uh, and we're able to you know create a manufacturing base for the world uh, in india so sanjay if i uh, if i can ask you from the perspective of the industry overall uh, we know that a decade from now maybe there will be some companies who will who will become redundant especially those that make engines and engine parts for example because that will be completely replaced by the electric motor or at the same time there is an opportunity where battery manufacturing will take off in a big way and suddenly you will find that right now if the oil is being produced by oil companies where automotive companies have no role to play now that oil is being removed replaced by batteries and battery is still a very much an automotive domain so actually the pie might actually increase multifold because you don't have oil anymore and you just have the battery and the electricity and electricity itself while not being produced by the industry you will need chargers and you will need other equipment which also are linked to automotive uh, supply chain so from that perspective this whole pain that the industry will feel over the next decade of transition is it a more of a challenge or is it a bigger opportunity that lies at the at the end of the day so so when with with challenges come opportunities you know so it's it's a mix of both i don't feel that the ic will go away completely uh, there will be platforms which will use 
the combustion engine uh, and therefore engine manufacturers will have uh, you know a place uh, in in the industry uh, however there will be a lot of electrification and you know again our industry fortunately is uh, is such that we have a diverse range of or, or segments of customers you know when you look at problems that we're facing today and i'm divert going a little uh, diver, diverting a little bit when you look at semiconductor issue you know the tractor industry doesn't face that problem at all so as a component industry we need to balance out you know our supply chain and uh, our our customer base and uh, unfortunately we have that uh, advantage of having a different customer segments so whilst most will move to electric but there will be different <clears throat> as well you know there's a lot of talk of hydrogen fuel there's a lot of talk of you know um, uh, different sorts of ev whether it be hybrid as uh, you know uh, as, as some companies are looking at so so you know component manufacturers uh, should use this or see, should see this as an opportunity okay thank you uh, mangua let me let me uh, 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 talk to you now and uh, for those who do not know uh, she is heading a company uh, which is trying to aggregate demand and come up with large tenders uh, for, like, for example, a tender for one lakh electric three wheelers. And now she's working with various state governments where you can again aggregate demand for their own employees so that they move away from petrol driven two wheelers to electric two wheelers. And you have really, uh, in a way, show, are showing leadership uh, kind of a position as far as aggregating and, and ensuring demand is concerned. Uh, Tell us about your experience so far. What are the challenges that you are facing? And what is the motivation for you as a company to get into this electric vehicle space? Thank you so much. for Thank you so much for having me on this panel. And it's great to meet all of you. I don't think I've met any of you in person yet. Uh, although I have, I, I've, you know, we've been leasing MG cars. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, allow me, Suman, to give a little bit of background to what this uh, relatively new company is doing. Uh, it, we're a government entity and uh, nine months old. And so in a way, as far as mobility is concerned, it's uh, very new. And there has been a, a leasing business I inherited from the parent company, which has been leasing four wheelers. Uh, at the end of almost two, over two years, we don't have too many on the road. We've got about 1,600 of them, and I inherited maybe about 12 or 1,300 of them on a leasing model. The, since the development of this company or since the, the, the coming of this company, the objective is to deliver, it's an energy company, so to deliver affordable, accessible, and clean. And mobility is very much, or electric mobility is very much part of the overall energy transition business. It is, after all, worldwide the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. I noticed some of you have also made a note of that. As far as India is concerned, it's also the third largest in India. And out of that, I think the majority, over 80% or 90% even, comes from road transport. That's pretty much everything that we're talking about right now. The rest is civil aviation and things like that. Pollution is a big problem. I mean, of course. But finally, I'm finding that after so many years, the market is finally coming up. And we're taking EVs seriously. I mean, it shows from all of the policies that pretty much every state, every few days is, is coming out with one policy after another. And for the first time, you're seeing states compete with each other on which policy is more aggressive than, um, than someone else's. So the objective of this company is I'd like to make this a, a market maker if there ever were to be one. If there ever were an energy transition company, this would be it. So the aggregation of demand is a is an exercise, is a tool, is a tool in a, in a government company's toolbox. What are the options uh, we have as a company to build the market? We can deploy at scale. We will have to deploy at scale. It's just, it's not efficient to do anything else outside of doing it at scale. So we've got a two-wheeler business where we're leasing out two-wheelers uh, via, in fact, an app um, that you can sit on your bed and scroll around and go buy a two-wheeler. Uh, we're using concessional money because these are two wheelers being made available to government employees. So we need to match the uh, the salaries of these of these employees who are likely to buy a vehicle of that range between fifty thousand and a lakh point two or lakh point three. So our then what what other option do I have? We've got to finance it. We're not manufacturers. We're not research people. 
um, there isn't there is some value in buying and selling, but that's not really where we build an ecosystem. So we've got to figure out the business of financing it. I noticed that uh, none of you have talked about the cost of acquisition problem. There is a sticker shock uh, with an EV. There's a sticker shock even now with an EV. So we have to get past that sticker shock to get it into deployment. Um, we want to monetize the benefits. We keep talking about greenhouse gas reductions. There is no initiative yet to monetize the carbon credits coming out of here. I've spent the last 20 years in all kinds of environmental um, discussions. I've spent, and most of my career was in carbon markets. We don't seem to have monetized it, and I'd like to do it. This is a central government entity, and we can keep track of every bike, provided we think ahead, meaning you put a little device in there to see where that vehicle is moving around. We don't monetize the air quality benefits. The amount of money the central government and state governments spend on air quality is massive. But those are, that is the kind of money we should be able to use a little bit of it to, to quantify some of these benefits. We'd like to take back the waste. I'm asked again and again, so what happens to these batteries and what happens to lithium and the geopolitics of all of that? And things are moving so fast uh, in India right now that it's, it's hard to respond to that question about what happens to the end of life battery when I can barely get 2,000 vehicles on the street right now. So, but we've got to address that. So I'd like to be able to do that. And through the whole thing, must tech enable it? So I don't have all of the answers on all of this, but also know that in the hurry that the market currently has, um, I, I work very closely in the last one or two months. We just launched a scheme in, in the government, in, in Kerala, for the government of Kerala to put out two wheelers on the, on the roads. Uh, we're backed up with demand. We're going to now launch in, the, in Andhra Pradesh and I fear that we will be backed up again with demand. Um, we will launch in Telangana, in Goa, and we're in discussions with Delhi. And the manufacturers tell me that we just don't have that kind of supply. Uh, the enthusiasm of, the, of consumers, the hurry of states, if one state does it, another state wants it immediately. Uh, and when you tech enable it, you can make it available immediately because once you've impaneled all the manufacturers on your app, as we have done, we opened a new page and we impaneled them on another state. So underneath all this, if I ever were to, if I were to say, well, what, is, what are the options? Of course, aggregate the demand, but that's mostly to deploy at scale. Uh, right. And we will have to purchase a vehicle in order to lease it out. And then to do everything around it, all of the things I was saying, you know, uh, ensure that it's taken back, it's monetized appropriately, it's monitored, uh, maintain quality, we don't have that much experience on durability of, of batteries. I just don't know how long this, I don't think anyone has that kind of performance data um, that matters. So the jury is out on a lot of things and for which we have to monitor because it's, the last thing you'd want is all of this enthusiasm in a few years, us coming back and one battery is better than another battery and Indian conditions were not considered and so on and so forth. There are lots of things to learn and maybe in a few months, or maybe some of these panels, we will be saying that we've got to fix the plane while flying it. Okay. But this is the this is roughly what you know what we're the the sense I'm getting in the last five six months that we've been we've been in this business full scale full speed. Is I worry a little bit about supply. That's a short term concern. Okay. Um, we have figured out a, a way to finance two wheelers, three wheelers, and four wheelers. In any case, we have a bit, we have a lease, and it's a fairly small piece of the overall market. And are right now looking to do large scale contracting for public transit for buses, basically for the um, main cities. So the EV discussion has been really has been across all of the vehicle categories, the markets for which each of them are quite different. So that's, that's really our objective, to build out the whole market here. So, so Mahua, uh, do you think the industry is doing enough? And because I sense that there is a disconnect between what the industry believes the market is ready for, and probably the market is already there where the industry doesn't know uh, that consumers are ready, consumers are looking at options, consumers want to buy EVs, but probably not enough is available in the market. So. Do you, do you think there is a disconnect between what manufacturers are thinking and what consumers are thinking? So I, I can't answer for the four-wheelers, of course, because we don't have that much demand for, for the four-wheelers. I understand MG has 
700 orders, but I'm also very aware it's a very small spec in the overall. I mean, I'd like to have, I'd like for us to be to saying we've got 7,000 in, in the month. In the two wheelers, in the, man, the manufacturers that I've been discussing with in the two wheeler space, I think perhaps um, didn't see this wave coming up so quickly. Uh, to quote a person I met two day, a few days ago, it, they call it the problem of plenty, meaning of course, there's so much demand coming up and simply didn't expect this level of demand coming up at the same time. And there's a lot of uh, noise, quote unquote noise. The industry is behaving a little bit differently. There are old manufacturing companies, technology companies where R&D is quite serious in, in the automotive business. Now that has been, that has the involvement of private equity and that behaves very differently. It's much more market savvy. It's more commercially uh, it, it operates at a different commercial scale than some of our older uh, automotive company kind of minds. So that that is a change that at least in the two wheeler business is quite it's becoming quite clear. Three wheelers I can't comment yet because we have a, a tender that's live uh, where we've aggregated a significant amount of demand. Uh, the tender still is still yet to close. So. Time will tell what the supply situation on the three wheelers looks like. Some of it is also um, what the demand situation looked like. Not everybody wants 15,000 three wheelers in one go. They want to spread out over, over some months. So in an ideal situation, we'll be able to carve out on both sides, supply and demand, and sculpt that out to match. Um, okay. As far as buses is concerned, I haven't been, I've now traveled to nine cities discussing buses. I'm in Bombay as I, as I speak here. The, every city is buying electric buses. Once you've bought 500 electric buses, I can't foresee how anybody is going to go out, buy a diesel bus next. So electric buses is, the, is, 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 is it as far as the SUs are concerned, the state transport undertakings. Um, there's massive supply. I mean, there's, there's going to be a huge demand. They will have to, we will have to figure out a way to get to that supply. And it will be the state's, um, let's say, problem to figure out how to finance these things. Right. Thank you. Uh, Rajiv, I'll, I'll come to you now uh, from, from Deloitte. You are the, uh, the analyst voice here, the, uh, so, to, so to say, the third party here. Uh, which do not, does not have a direct bearing, but you do uh, follow the automotive practice very, very closely. Uh, so there are two major criticisms that often come about for electrification. One is bell-to-wheel emissions, as, and as Sashank San mentioned now, is a new term which has come out, which is cradle-to-grave kind of emissions. So if we are producing dirty electricity, and that electricity is going into a car, are we really... Uh, making a clean vehicle. Uh, that is one. And the other bit is about the lack of charging infrastructure and range anxiety. And it doesn't look like we have solved these two problems, or I would say suppositions conclusively yet. What is your sense? Uh, how valid are these two kind of criticisms that let's wait on a bit. Let's, the jury is still out whether electric vehicles are really that clean or is there something else that we should look at? And secondly, there are no charging infrastructure right now. So let's wait before we launch products when the charging infrastructure is there. What, what is your sense on these two aspects? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Sumit. And thanks for having me. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, don't come from any OEM, though I worked with industry before getting into consulting. But let me put my thoughts across uh, on both the points, Sushant. So beginning with the first point, which was... Uh, more to do whether uh, is EV really a clean technology or not. I think um, uh, we need to understand that when it comes to ICE technology, there is only one way that energy gets produced, which is by burning of fossil fuels. That's right. the only way that energy gets produced. And we know that that is polluting because at the end of the day, whenever you burn fossil fuel in the vehicle at that time, there is a lot of emissions which happens, which is whether it is uh, CX emissions, COX emissions, NOx emissions, particulate matter, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to electric vehicles, there are there is not one way that energy gets produced. Energy can get produced by multiple ways. If we think energy is going to get produced only by coal burning at some place, and we think that's the only way that batteries are going to get charged, 
then probably we, we may think that, is it really clean? But if the batteries are getting charged by, say, a renewable source of energy, could be solar panels, could be windmills, or could be any other source of energy which is renewable in nature, then the equation changes. So we should keep in mind that EV has a choice in, in the way in which it can get the battery can get power. And that is what will determine actually what is the final carbon footprint of this value chain. Now going ahead, why is it important that we continue to focus on EVs is that the end is not just going to be in EVs. People are already talking about now fuel cell electric vehicles, which is going to be hydrogen based, which means that the battery is still going to be there in some form, but the battery is going to get power from a fuel cell, which is going to be a hydrogen fuel cell in some sense, right? So, so the, 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 the direction is that ICE will always remain the way it is. Of course, with every emission norm change and tightening of regulations, we are trying to make it cleaner. But how clean can we make it? But with EV, the promise of making it cleaner is far, far more higher given the choice. So that is the point one that, that uh, uh, Suman, that you had in response to that. Right. The, second is, uh, the second is you had a question which was around the charging infrastructure. I think right. that uh, I think that we should think about infrastructure in a manner that that we think of any other infrastructure for that matter. Okay, and and I think that we require a large amount of public charging infrastructure to come into the country. But let me just lay out two or three points, and let me connect these dots as I speak. The first point is uh, think about road as an infrastructure. Okay, when when road as an infrastructure is built, you get private players to build road. But when the private players build road, they don't decide whether the vehicle is going to be driven on the left side or the right on the right side. They don't decide what signage is going to be there on the road. They don't decide whether tolling will be there or not there or what will it be and so on and so forth. Government does put in play a lot of policies and guidelines in terms of some of these things. Now, similarly, when it comes to charging infrastructure, I think the government will have to play a role where the government will have to think, okay, what are the ground rules that the government would like to lay? So that when the charging infrastructure comes, it can be used across different models, different vehicles, different OEMs, and so on and so forth. If we think that every vehicle is going to be very unique, every battery is going to be very unique, every charging type is going to be very unique, and then I need to have a charging infrastructure, I think we are going to create a very, very complex problem there. But if we think of the analogy of a road infrastructure and say that, can I create a charging infrastructure by laying some ground rules? I think we'll make the problem slightly simpler. But nonetheless, it is still not going to solve. The next point, as I said, I'll just take two or three points and all are going to get connected, is that it calls for a lot of stakeholders to come together. So, so it's not going to be just the OEMs, but we have to think of the oil and gas companies. What is the role that they will have in future? And can they have a role to play when it comes to charging infrastructure? What is the role that the power equipment manufacturers and the power distribution companies have and can they come and have a role to play in this? Mahua brought a very important point in terms of affordability. What is the financial institution's role going to be when it comes to charging infrastructures? And of course, the OEMs, because they are, they, are, they are the vehicle manufacturers and what is the role that they will play? So I think that's the second point related to the charging infrastructure. And the third right. thing, I think, from a consumer perspective, uh, I think it's very, very important. And I think the onus is here more on the OEMs and, and my co-panelists here. I think that while there is a lot of talk of electrification, there is still a lot of fear in the minds of the consumer, whether to buy an electric vehicle or not. Uh, I, I have personally met a lot of people, a lot of people come and speak, being the auto sector guy, people will come and talk to you. Uh, this is the electric vehicle, should I buy or not buy? And you get into discussions with them as to what is it. We need to understand that it's it's probably the second largest spend for a consumer after buying a home. That's the kind of spend that a consumer does when he buys a, a vehicle. And for, for doing that kind of a spend, the consumer wants to be very, very certain on the technology, whether this technology is reliable. Is my product going to be reliable? Will I get charging whenever I want charging to happen and so on and so forth? Now, I think that the OEMs have built products which are reliable. It's a question of customer education because the, the fear which is there, the doubts that the customer has, I think that, that we need to address, whether it is four wheelers, whether it is two wheelers, but we need to address that fear which is there in the mind of the customers. And 
uh, provide comfort to the customers by ensuring that it's not just the vehicles being put on the road, but doing whatever it takes to ensure charging infrastructure is also made available on the road. So I think it's a combination of these three things which is going to really help eventually in terms of moving to a point where we see electrification really happening. Thank you, very valid points. Uh, uh, let me now uh, go back to uh, Sashank San and, and Rajiv uh, of MG. Uh, there is an elephant in the room and we talked about, I spoke about the disconnect between consumers and OEMs as far as demand is concerned. And I talk, talked about this too, Mahuva. The other disconnect is between the government and the industry. The government wants the industry to just go full on as far as EVs are concerned. And we heard about that in the recent CAM and ACMA annual conventions as well. Uh, all the government representatives, they just said that, what is the point? Why are you still waiting on the fence, sitting on the fence? Uh, this is the time to hit the ground running. And the industry uh, looks like they want to wait a little longer, especially on the four-wheeler side. So Sashank San, how do you, how do you react to this when the government says that why is Maruti waiting? Where is your electric car? Why are you not there? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, some of the uh, earlier speakers have brought out the points which uh, is uh, making uh, uh, the EVs not so popular, not just in India, but across the world. By the way, across the world, the penetration of EVs in four-wheeler, I'm talking only of uh, four-wheeler uh, industry, is just above 2%. And even China, where it began in big uh, numbers, uh, it's now the hybrids, uh, the plug-in hybrids, which are uh, gaining uh, a much larger ground. But as I said, probably EVs is the future. It's not about weather, but when. Uh, the connect disconnect actually happens from the consumer point of view. So you would have seen, Suman, many manufacturers. And in fact, uh, somebody said, uh, we have it and we flaunt it. Uh, so a lot of manufacturers, uh, not MG, but uh, many manufacturers uh, um, uh, take EVs as an opportunity to flaunt technology. That technology anyway is available. So it's, uh, it's not as if it's a technology which is uh, so, uh, so remote that it can't be flaunted by everybody. Of course, it can be flaunted by everybody. I, I know manufacturers who flaunt this technology by bringing in some models and sell large diesels in very, very large numbers. Uh, so that doesn't really help the environment. So if basic thing is whether you have from a customer point of view and customers do when in interaction say that otherwise this talk of environment is purely what in Urdu we call Mukaddas Khwab. It is like uh, um, some uh, utopian uh, uh, dream unless you make it practical. What is going to make it practical? One, the cost of ownership, the cost of acquisition of the car has to be low, which means, and at the moment, even though battery technology is such that you know you, you have now chemistries and packets, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the cell packaging technology, which is bringing the cost down dramatically. Remember 10 years back, it was about $1,200 a kilowatt uh, hour. It is now, uh, I think, less than uh, 140 or so uh, uh, dollars a, a kilowatt. So it is, it is going in that direction, clearly. So cost of uh, ownership is very important uh, for, for the larger usage and adoption by the consumers. For, so that, uh, you know, that is what is going to make a big difference in the environment ultimately, which is the, uh, uh, which is the basic reason why governments and activists across the world are pushing for it. Second, I think the charging infrastructure. That is another concern which consumers have. Uh, we talked also about the range anxiety. So I think uh, 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 Maua uh, uh, talked about the sticker shock. Uh, that's a good uh, 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 thing to say. Uh, or also about range anxiety, because you need to have a good charging infrastructure. And the, the battery actually is a large portion of the total cost of the vehicle. And if you have large batteries and heavier batteries, it actually, at some point of time, the costs uh, start going against the adoption. So I think we the industry needs to sort it out many things before they, they you know before it can have uh, that and we have to look at the business side also to make it more sustainable so it is not just about uh, 
whether we want to go into it of course everybody wants to get, go into it but it is also how to go, get, get into it and how from a consumer point it can become very easy to adopt this technology for their vehicles for example you mentioned uh, uh, some uh, the 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 production of uh, i think rajiv mentioned about production of the electric vehicles in our case in india for example most of it is coal uh, is coal based so uh, is that a good way uh, probably we have to work separately uh, on that as well germany has actually excess uh, electricity for them it is imperative to quickly get into and no oil and we have of course uh, not enough electricity to power our televisions and refrigerators in many parts of our country so uh, there is a there is a whole environment one has to look at but purely from a consumer point of view and i am i am talking the disconnect is coming only because we need to have in place a practical solution which is not going to be uh, uh, uncomfortable for the customer it should be from a consumer point of 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 things uh, be adapt uh, be be easy to adopt and i think that is where we are working on and by the way when i say hybrid uh, the, the road to 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 uh, uh, a sustainable uh, uh, ev it, it is true hybridization and why i talk about that is because you also have to consider the component supply the localization if you have high cost of acquisition you can't have large volumes for localization on the other hand if you don't have localization the prices continue to be high so how do now the power the train of a ev and a, and and a, and a, a hybrid vehicle there are common parts you can get through it now rajiv made a great point that of course the adoption will be very fast once you reach that inflection point uh, that inflection point uh, by current uh, uh, estimates 2030 you will probably have have about 10% or so in india as evs in four wheelers now if you look at uh, uh, from today till 2030 india will be making 70 million cars i'm taking a cagr of about 7 7 and 1/2% 70 million cars out of which let's say 10% evs are 63 million cars which will be ic what do you do about that then you need to have something which makes them more fuel efficient hybrid is it cng is another option you know if you look at cleaner vehicles so you need to look at the other part also and the only disconnect i believe it's happening is that if we can take uh, care of these uh, things the uh, sticker shock and also the uh, the range anxiety uh, also the localization from a component point of view i think there is no doubt that uh, we will uh, get there sooner than later and one final point i think this also coming from mauva's uh, talk about uh, she mentioned about fixing the plane while flying so right now actually uh, we are not really flying uh, as far as four wheelers is concerned we are still uh, on the runway and uh, we 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 still can do some uh, we could have some uh, you know help from the ground before we start flying and then of course things will come up and we will have to fix the plane as we fly i can always bank on you to get us very good analogies so we are still taxiing on the runway and not quite on in the air yet uh, uh, rajiv i'm I'll, i'll come to you uh, sashank san mentioned 10% by 2030 uh, given the seriousness of the climate crisis that we have is that enough and do we need to push a little harder so you know a few things uh, let's look at the environment uh, across the globe Uh, i think everybody is talking about sustainability it's not really about vehicles okay sustainability is the bigger is 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 the biggest uh, issue right now and everybody is talking about it even oil companies are talking about it ships are talking about it right and shipping consumes you know a very very polluted industry the shipping itself so everybody is talking about this uh, when you talk about energy in a country um, every country is making a plan to get out of coal or reduce dependence on coal in the next 15 20 years including india okay uh, when rajiv of deloitte uh, you know talked about uh, uh, this uh, you know like in many if you take country by country right from china china is the biggest polluter so they're planning next 20 years india's planning next 20 years i think everybody is moving towards that sustainable model and they will depend more on renewable forms of energies in, including nuclear also you know so so i think that basket will change you know so that's one part and and i think we are answerable to uh, uh to the environment and and as we say uh, you know there are various stakeholders now you know you need to maximize uh, 
the stakeholders thing, not only shareholder, and, and government, environment, consumers are part of stakeholders. Coming to consumer part, let's talk about next 10, 15 years, what kind of consumers are going to be there. These are millennials and Gen Z. You know, these guys want to make impact. They're different than me for sure at my age, right? And they want to make different kind of an impact. You know, uh, and 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 they they are looking for uh, you know a, 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 some solutions for this environment. They are supporting this whole movement in a big way, in my opinion. You know, like two years back, if uh, if when you did a survey and and one agency did the survey and they said maybe only five percent consumers were interested in buying EV. Right now, 25, 30 percent consumers are willing to look at an EV. Yes, there are lots of questions, lots of unanswered questions, you know, but they're interested to look at the uh, options, what's available. So, you know, so in my view, um, uh, I think um, when Mawa talked about in two wheelers, the, and I think all of us can say change is happening faster than two wheeler expected. You know, I would not, I would like, I would like to raise my hand and say that in the next 10, 15 years, maybe 70, 80% of the two wheeler market will be EV in India. 70, 80% guys, okay, in I feel in, in next 10 years. You know, now let's talk about four wheeler. Now it may be 10 or 12% in 2030, I don't know. But after 10 or 12% to become 30% and 40% will take another five, six years. You know, so it the change is happening is going to happen very fast. In, in four wheeler industry, I would like to believe, um, you know, and, and, and I would say it humbly that actually, OEMs are not able to give the choice to consumer, you know, and we are not talking about uh, that when you start that 100,000 customers today will buy EV in a month out of 250,000. No, but definitely 10,000, 20,000 can buy even right now. And why they're not buying? Because we are not able to give choice. There are only two or three credible options. And even we, from MG perspective, our sticker price is very high. We are not a mass car, but the moment you have 10 lakhs rupees car, 15 lakhs rupees car, you see the, you see the numbers. So I would like to bet right now, if this year, let's say to next year, let's say 2022, if we have four or five suppliers and their price is around 10 to 15 lakhs of rupees, then let's talk about volumes. The volume is going to be maybe 15, 20,000 per month, which is not small. Right, so I think we all need to work together, and 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 I think uh, OEMs need to do their job, governments need to do their job. And one more thing, I want to say it that uh, you know the whole thing is about collaboration right now, you know, and 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 you know the thing is if we do not do it right now, some disruptor will come to uh, who will enter like Tesla at a high point. Maybe there will be a Tesla of low low price point from somewhere it will come. You know, and they may they may disrupt the whole existing industry. You know, so and this will happen globally. Not only I'm not talking about India. So I think um, you know we need to collaborate, and and for that you know whether it's a component companies, whether it is you know there will and again think about it. Uh, you know, not a existing platform you convert into an EV because this is how normally we think. Think about a electric vehicle architecture completely from scratch. That's what Tesla did, right? And you do engineering locally inside the company. So then you control the cost and everything. And that's what probably will happen when somebody will bring a 10 lakhs rupees EV. And that would happen. So I think we need to collaborate with uh, government, charging companies, the management. There are a whole lot of new companies. End of life uh, cycle of battery. And, and by, by the way, we are working with some government agencies for can we use these old batteries for rural electrification, which is a great thing for India. You know, can we use these batteries in, in telecom towers where they can be used? We are talking about urban mining of these batteries. You can get some material out and can do the recycling. And these are all different players. I had not heard of some of these players one year back. You know, a lot of startups are there. So I think, I think this is what I think we need to collaborate and all. So I think we need to embrace this change rather than resist this change. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, writing is on the wall in my opinion. And I think uh, the change will be much faster than what we assume, even in four wheelers. Thank you. Can Thank just, you. Always, always. Yeah, yeah. Moa, please. Can I just come in on that? I just want to come in on what Rajiv said. I agree completely. And I'm so glad that you raised this on the choice problem, on the choice issue. Um, 
you know, I had said we've got about 1600 four wheelers on the road. It's almost, it's a two and a half year business and it's a straight jacketed lease with a standard EMI. I mean, it's a no brainer and it's almost given us with a rate card. If you want, there are two cars in the 24 lakh range and one in the 14 lakh and that's it. So on one hand, we go to governments and we say, you know, the only way you can make change is you, if you change your fleet. In other words, have a policy kind of direction to change your fleet. We're not in the business. I'm not in the business of leasing a car for the sake of leasing a car. That car is part of a much, much larger discussion on changing the entire fleet. And then I'm on the back foot because there's three cars on the road. So at some point, I find myself just backing out because there's a 14 lakh, which is in the affordability range of government entities who generally use fleet operators and they pay between 25, 33, 35, 36, that kind of thing per month uh, with drivers and so on and so forth. And then you get into this big long discussion of actually, you know, you pay for spares and then you pay for diesel and then you, so you do all this plus plus. Finding that plus plus accounting is painful, but just getting past that 33 thing is also extremely difficult because there are three cars on the road. So the day we have more choice in that 10 to 15 band, and I'm not even talking about the, the consumer on the road. Of course, the consumer on the road will think really seriously about buying that 10 to 15 rack range. At that range, we can change the government fleet, which is sizable, which is about six lakh cars on the road, very sizable. This end of life thing, I'm so glad that MG uh, raises that. I've really been looking forward to, um, we've been just, we've just not had time to issue an expression of interest. We, want, we are going to be issuing an EY because I'd like to be able to just get a size of the demand out there. And if need be, uh, put up a, a purchase, a, a, at least somewhat of an offtake, uh, offtake for these batteries. We seem to be missing this in-between thing. There's lots of old batteries looking like it's going to come up. And between that and the energy system is the whole repurposing business, which right now is, uh, is a little weak. If possible, we'd like to give a market signal that there is a price for this, we will use it. Convergence CSL will use it. We've got, we've got plants out in rural areas that are in need of storage, uh, where we could schedule a little bit or store a little bit of the power and who desperately need the capex to be lower in order to get past the tariff discussion with distribution companies. So there's a defined need. There seems to be an oncoming supply. And I'd appeal to all of the manufacturers that I, I'm not sure what you're doing with your batteries, or maybe that's just too, you know, it's too early to ask you that question. But whatever you think about doing with your batteries, if you don't have anything else to do with them, just try and dump them on us. Very interesting. Sashank San, Mangwa is waiting for your car whenever it comes. I think I think this is a good time for you. For you to tell us when when is the wagon R E V coming? Yeah, so I think I I don't think there is uh, any basic disagreement. Uh, what Rajiv said that uh, uh, Rajiv Chawa, I mean, uh, what he said uh, regarding uh, the direction or what Magwa said about the choice, uh, it's only a question of uh, in the current situation, probably those choices may not be easy to to to, to be offered. Because of the battery technology itself, is uh, the chemistry is not yet. Uh, we are not yet there in terms of uh, of, of offering something which is at a cost of acquisition in the range, which uh, uh, Maua mentioned. And uh, and 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 remember, uh, you know, as far as charging infrastructure is concerned, it is not just about offering choice and consumers will buy it. Uh, I know the people who are buying that 24, 25 lakh of vehicle. Last year, uh, the total sale uh, uh, was 5,000 vehicles in the whole year. Uh, in, in India, 90% research shows 90% of the people don't park vehicles at the same spot every night. Uh, this is true for uh, even people like me. I, I, I stay in an area called Vasant Kunj. I park wherever. If I get late, I park wherever uh, it's possible. And, you know, I after closing the doors, I move uh, some distance before I, uh, you know, put the lock on so that they should not start looking out who has parked the car in front of my uh, house. So, you know, that too, too happens. Uh, so th this is the, in, Jap in, in Japan, in US, 90% uh, of the vehicles are parked in the same spot every night. So those 24 lakh, 25 lakh category for which we are so excited, and they are not many, by the way, even in that range, they are people who are given a charger at a particular spot in their home or a garage and they can afford that, but not everybody. 
So if you really want to make a difference to the environment, as uh, some of us uh, uh, really seem to be uh, uh, pushing for, and we all are uh, uh, pro that environment, then then uh, we need to make uh, some do something about the infrastructure of charging, and also to get the cost of acquisition within the reach of the usual the normal customer. So I think that is where the challenge is. Nobody is arguing. Nobody is saying that uh, direction is not electric. I think a lot of people spent uh, time uh, proving that that is the direction. Yes, of course, that is the direction. There is no debate on that. A lot of people said if there if there, it is available at a lower price, it would be better. Of course, there is uh, no doubt on that. Question is how, when uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, all of us should work on to make it possible and make a real difference to the environment. Uh, uh, which everybody of us are so passionate about. You will not tell us about Wagon REV, but I'll try again later at some other time, I guess. Uh, Sa- Sanjay, I, I guess you, you need to leave, but I will not let you go before I have one question for you, uh, Sanjay, uh, Mr. Kapoor, uh, which is that we are right now facing an issue of chip shortage, uh, which is in a way completely uh, outfoxed the industry. Uh, we also do not make uh, lithium-ion cells, for example, which is an in- integral part of uh, battery right now. How important is it for India and for component makers to start looking at lithium-ion cell manufacturing before EV journey can really take off? Because if we don't make it here, we will always be you know, dependent on somebody or the other for these, which can come back at us just like the chip shortage is hurting us. So, you know, Suman, absolutely, uh, this is a, a high risk, uh, you know, when you're dependent on on a source. Uh, and I think the whole game is about diversification. You know, with regard to the chip shortage, like I said, you know, we're 7% of the industry. I mean, we're 7% buying uh, from the industry and therefore we're facing this a huge shortage and, and we don't really have a leverage because we buy from distributors as opposed to manufacturers directly. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, ability for... Auto component guys to put up chips is obviously doesn't exist, but someone in you know some big uh, business house is going to have to look at chip short- shortage and see if we can put up capacity. And uh, similar to to other uh, you know raw material uh, sources, we cannot be dependent. You know, in our own business, we're looking at uh, R and D to develop motors without magnets, so that we're not dependent on rare earth materials. Uh, and you know, this sort of innovation is happening in the automotive uh, in the component space and it needs to continue and I think you know batteries is going to play a very important role going forward if I listen to all the speakers and I completely agree with them uh, you know it's not about um, uh, it's it's about when we go electric and I think it's inevitable uh, you know there was a recent report in fact I read this morning that talked about eliminating um, you know uh, net greenhouse gases uh, through uh, efforts in energy, food, and transport. Uh, so there's a lot of efforts going into, uh, you know, building technologies to eliminate uh, this this entire, uh, you know, this whole uh, issue of emissions and ESG, etc. So I feel that you know batteries is an important uh, aspect uh, and is going to be a huge uh, raw material, uh, you know, lithium ion, etc. We're going to have to look at what we can do with that and how we can invest uh, to ease the supply chain in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. We are uh, we have overshot our time, actually, and running out of time. Uh, just one question to you, Nagesh. Uh, I guess you also have to leave for a meeting. Uh, there is a sense that the inflection point, at least in the two and three wheelers, is already there. Uh, maybe in a few months' time, we will, we will hit it. What is your sense? I know, as Sashank San mentioned, uh, the four-wheeler is still taxing on the runway. Are we mid-flight or are we taking off right now in the two and three-wheeler space? Yeah, thank you, Suman. Uh, I think uh, it's it's very interesting times and I think it's definitely in the uh, taking off stage. Uh, I think I'll let the market pundits decide when the inflection point will exactly hit because it's a combination of the battery prices going down to the right level and it's also the uh, volume soaring, right? But one thing I'll tell you, we are oversubscribed. 40% 40% of my customers are first time two wheeler customers who have never used a two wheeler before, right? And we have both B2B and B2B C customers, right? A uh, lot of the technology itself is not new. 20 years ago, I worked on an electric vehicle in Detroit. 
the question is can you make it adaptable can you make it work for india at the right value proposition right and in our case uh, unlike the four wheeler batteries can be removed we have swappable or removable battery that i have customers taking up to their high rise and charging it on their 15 amp so i think some problems are solvable awareness is improving that's a tremendous thing because the awareness is improving and uh, localization and the supply chains are getting better uh, we are still not there uh, and financing because we look at it as an ecosystem financing needs to get better for electric mobility i think we'll get there we'll get there every month is a better month and yes if china can do it why not us i think two wheeler and three wheeler is right on the angle good nagesh thank you so much uh, we do not have the time to take questions we have got quite a quite a few and it's very tough to actually decide which one to take and which one not to so i'll probably not take any because if we, we simply have run out of time most of you have meetings in a in the next two or three minutes i guess but one last quick question and you can just answer and then then we can wrap this up when do you think is will the inflection point come in your each of your respective segments give us give us a year when do you think the inflection point is going to happen for electric vehicles sachan san starting with you oh so i think somewhere around uh, 20 uh, 28 to 30 types so within a decade you saying yeah yeah okay rajiv i am going to i am going to bet that you are going to set into the 25 if sachank san is saying no, 0 no, no no i i agree with sachank no. i agree with sachank you know because it will take some time it's not going to be that easy but even in 2027 that number is going to be big and we need to do a lot of stuff to even achieve that number so i think i agree with sushant and rajiv we have to uh, we have to discuss that bet rajesh <laughs> <laughs> give, give us a year when is the inflection point for two wheelers i leave that for the pundits but uh, i would say it's more like uh, 25 Five. Sanjay, if you can give your sense of when do you perceive the inflection oh, point is going to come for four wheelers and two wheelers? It's a very difficult question because every year they bring forward the date. Uh, you know, we talked about twenty thirty. Now twenty thirty has become twenty twenty five, which has become twenty twenty three. I think it's here, um, and it's it's very very soon. Uh, we're going to have to just it, it's going to happen overnight, and and I think we need to be ready for this. Good. Thank you. On that note, I think uh, we will we will wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very. Uh, I learned a lot from this discussion, and I'm sure we will have these kind of discussions more often because, like we like we say, there is a lot of noise around EVs, and as everybody agrees that that is the future. That future could be 2030. It could be 2035. But future future is electric for sure. it's it's a good way to end this debate uh, on world ev day thank you so much for your time thanks sir thank, thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you